Last of you uh, get seated. Let me make uh, one quick announcement and then we start. So um, regarding the student talks, uh, they will be again uh, today at 4 p.m. And if you uh, want to give a talk, uh, please send the slides to Felix by 2 p.m. So, all uh, right, very good. And then uh, without further ado, uh, we're going to start the second week of this school uh, and with the uh, lectures by Tillman Plin from the University of Heidelberg. Uh, I think we've known for a while, so we were postdocs together in Madison. And Tillman is an expert on, uh, on particle physics on so many uh, uh, different uh, fields. And he's going to tell us about uh, the use of machine learning for uh, collider physics. All right, so Tillman. That's right, yeah. Um, thank you thank you for having me. Great to be here. I haven't been in Brazil for way too long. Um, so it's great to be back. Um, yeah. Um, if you look at the, um, at the title of my, my, my lecture, I also t I'm supposed to talk about like the future colliders, um, future techniques, and so on and so forth. And um, there is a fundamental problem with that, and that is that um, I think you should listen to like Christoph Grosjean's colloquium to like learn something about uh, future colliders and like you know the excitement, the exciting perspective of a future plus and minus machine in particular. While I'm kind of a hadron collider guy, and I'll instead tell you like how to get the best of, out of hadron colliders. Um, and um, for me, the future colliders is two, if you ask me, uh, future colliders. One of them is the worst naming disaster in all of particle physics. It's called the HLLHC, right? This is like, you know, the LHC, but with, like, you know, I don't know, 10 times as much luminosity. Like, you know, as a field, I don't know. You have to be like, you know, I don't know what kind of field you have to be to just call this the HLLHC rather than give it a new name. Because, you know, everybody is rebuilding their, their, their detectors. They're re rebuilding the machine. They're, like, you know, running much bigger much bigger um, data sets. And like, you know, analyses at the high lumen LHC will be nothing like we've seen, like, you know, at the, at the, in, the, in the run one, for instance, of the LHC, because it's just so much more data. And this is like, you know, where I'm gonna go into machine learning here. And then, of course, there's this other great machine, like, you know, that we wanna look to, like, to talk to Christoph about this. And this is the FCCHH, which is an even bigger, even more powerful machine with even more data. And, um, before I like, you know, go into this machine learning stuff, um, <laughs> um, and unfortunately, it's also going to be at a time scale planned that I'm not sure I'm going to see it. I'm actually I'm fairly confident if I keep traveling the, like, you know, the way I am, I'm not going to see it. Um, so, um, any case, so I, but I'll talk a little bit about like, you know, hadron colliders. And so, so like, you know, what my lecture is going to be on, like, it's going to be on machine learning. I, I want to be starting very, very basic. But from a physics perspective, you're not going to hear anything like, you know, about like, you know, brains and like, you know, cells and stuff like this. Like, you know, like more like a numer numerical tool. And then I, I want to cover a bunch of like, you know, topics which are or like machine learning applications which are very closely related to, to, um, to, to the LHC program. And so I'm going to have five lectures. So the first thing I'm going to do today is I'm going to give you a little bit of an introduction to machine learning because I figure most of you have actually not dealt with the neural net. Can I just like ask, how many of you have done a fit? Like any kind of fit function, like you know, in whatever, like you know, Py Python or something. That's great, good. And how many of you have trained a net neural network? Okay, that's about what I expect. So like, you know, you'll be, you'll be surprised how little difference there is between running a fit and training a neural network if you write, know the right um, 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 software. And I'm not gonna give you the tutorial. You can find great tutorials online and so on and so forth, but I'll try to t teach you a little bit about what we can do at Hadron Colliders with machine learning. The background to this, I wanna say, is like, you know, um, when I was young, we were all told that like, you know, E plus and minus machines are precision machines. And Hadron Collider, uh, hard, uh, colliders are discovery machines. And then it turned out, that turned out to be like just very wrong. Um, first of all, because hadron colliders couldn't do great pre precision physics, as we know now. And secondly, also because they didn't, didn't discover all that much. 
right? I mean, so conveniently, conveniently, we discovered the top quark at the Hadron Collider, we discovered at the Higgs at the Hadron Collider. And then, don't get me wrong, I think, like, you know, I'm, I, I really do LH, high Lumi LHC physics because I, I want to discover stuff, and I think we're going to, we, want, we will discover stuff, like, you know, for instance, dark matter or CP violation. But, um, jokes aside, um, it's a precision machine now. And precision machine, in a sense that, well, anything you do for the Hadron Collider, you can never calculate anything by hand. Just impossible. Why is that? Because, like, you know, you calculate a cross section, you can do a simple 2 2 2, like, you know, whatever, q q bar to uh, e plus e minus. You can probably do this by hand, right? If you spend a little bit of time, you can do the m squared by hand to leading on a perturbation theory. However, there's two problems with that. First of all, um, q q bar t plus e minus is not pp to e plus e minus, which means you, then you have to do numerics to get like the pp out. And secondly, leading order and perturbation theory is, is way, way, way too imprecise for what we do actually at the machine. You have to do numerics, right? So I'll t tell you a little bit about, like, you know, from a perspective of an LHC physicist, how we can do, um, use machine learning or modern numerical tools um, to do Hadron Collider physics. So, as I said, um, today I'm going to um, in introduce um, neural networks. And I'm going to introduce neural, net neural networks not the standard way, but the way I think physicists should introduce them. Um, then, um, second lecture tomorrow, I'll talk about classification. So, classification is essentially, for those of you who know this like, term, a tagging of jets. Um, basically asking the question here is a jet, is this a top inside, or a quark or gluon, or a beam? This is a very, like, you know, old problem. I mean, experimentalists have, like, you know, theorists have dealt with this for a very long time. However, like, you know, it turns out that machine learning, I mean, this was kind of the entry um, of machine learning into the LHC physics program in so many ways. Um, the third lecture on Wednesday, I'll talk about something that's new and that I, is very close to, like, my heart, and that is how do we find anomalies? How do we find stuff that's different from what, like, you know, from backgrounds? Uh, without having to say this is my signal. And then, like, you know, this is something where, like, you know, machine learning can actually teach, uh, give us some new tools. Um, and then on Thursday, I'll talk about generation. Um, so this is, like, event generation, if you think. So something I've been doing for a long time is, like, you know, gener event generation for the LHC. Like, you know, for a while in my life, I worked with a group called MudGraph. Um, to do how to generate events. I'm very good friends um, with, with the Sherpa people. And, you know, like these uh, um, event generators, they're, like, you know, key for um, doing um, physics at the LHC. The most famous one, by the way, is Pythia. You might have heard about it. Like, in any case, so, like, you know, and again, machine learning can do something for those. And then the last lecture, I'm going to sh uh, show you, like, kind of a little bit of the power of machine learning when, you want to, when we want to actually do analyses. So analysis techniques that we always wanted to do, but we couldn't do, but with machine learning now we can do them. That's going to be the Friday lecture. Now, um, uh, my lecture is going to be based, it's going to be all Blackboard, pretty much all Blackboard. Um, it's based on my lecture notes. Um, they are linked. Um, I constantly update, it, update them with, uh, with um, versions that have fewer bugs. I'm not sure if this will ever converge, but like, you know, like, and this is way too many pages. But, um, yeah. So I should say these uh, lecture notes are not by no means representatives. They're Tillman's story about how our group in Heidelberg went into machine learning. Um, it's, a, um, it's a lecture that, like, you know, I gave in the last term. I, like, you know, wrote this up. And um, so this is not representative. Not, nobody else in the world would have written the lecture notes the same way as I did because, you know, this is just telling my life story, actually my life story of the last five years. When, like, you know, at some point, midlife crisis hits, you know, it's like I told you, like, you decide, oh, should I really buy a Porsche convertible? And said, like, I could do awesome machine learning instead. <laughs> and so, like, you know. I know we have, we have colleagues who take second professorships, for instance. Like, this is another way. Like, you know, we can. Like, there's lots of people, like, ways that people, like, you know, live their, their midlife crisis. And for me, it's machine learning. <laughs> Anyhow. Um, we can be, I, we, I can put plots later up here, but if, if, if you all just want to like, you know, look at your cell phones and look at the plots, I mean, in the meantime, we'll have to look at a few figures. Um, you can just pull this out, and then we can save ourselves switching off the light and like putting in the projector. I think I'll think about this until tomorrow. Um, these, uh, the, the lecture notes, they are linked to my homepage, so you can look at them there. Um, they should be updated. OK. The last thing, um, we do, do, do we run ni uh, 90 minutes, one through, right, one, one, pfft, through? In one run, we no no breathing. No, no, no. It's fine. If we don't break, ask questions on the way because I'm really tired. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah? Um, so like, you know, ask questions on the way, raise your hand, because what's the point? Like, you know, if I lose everybody out, um, and like, you know, then nobody gets anything out of it. Good. Yeah. Um, what should I say? Um, I don't see big data. Let me just like quote one number because then I've got a lot of people like you know are really impressed by this outside particle physics, and you should know this. Like you know, does anybody know what the data, what, what the, the, the rate, the data rate is that like an Atlas or CMS like you know produces per second? Anybody any idea? Guess how many like you know what's the like raw data before any triggering, before anything? The raw data, what do you, how, how much data? What's big data in terms of particle physics? My colleague always sent you, uh, my um, colleague always says, like, big data is, like, you know, if you cannot send, like, you know, a student down to the pit and, like, you know, carry a bunch of hard drives up every day. So, like, but seriously, what, what do you guess? Anybody, any guesses? Uh, it, what's the unit? <laughs> <laughs> hmm? Yeah. So, like, a terabyte is a, is a hard drive, a big hard drive, right? I mean, a reasonably, a reasonably hard, uh, hard, hard drive. Um, a petabyte is a thousand of them. And think of, think of a thousand hard drives, so think a petabyte a second. This is what the LHC produces. Uh, this is the kind of the data they, they, they sift through. The data, like the LHC, I, I one experiment fills, uh, if you were to, ha had to record all the data, which we don't, or they don't, <laughs> they don't. Um, if, we had, if they had to record this, they, um, they would have to like, you know, record a petabyte a second. This is clearly not possible, right? I mean, so, like, you know, but this is the data. You talk about this even at machine learning conferences. This is like when, when the people working for Facebook actually start listening. Like we just said this. Like you know, you, somebody from Meta in the army said, like, you know, what about a petabyte a second, right? Um, and the other thing is, like you know, when you when you um, have a, does any like do, do you work like you know particle theory, particle pheno? Who works on particle pheno and has ever like you generated something with Pythia, Markgraf, Sherpa, or any of these operators? Yeah, so quite a few, right? Think you actually, if you were to do something with those data sets, right? Um, for instance, machine learning, you want to train a neural network or like do fit something, right? I mean, you generate what? 100,000, a million, 10 million jets to play with? I mean, this is the kind of data we, we play with. Um, which is again, like, you know, if you look at machine learning people who work in like, you know, imaging, medical imaging, they are proud when they have like, you know, 100 and 150 images, right? Like, you know, our students have like a million. Right? I mean, so this is proper, this is proper lots of data, right? And the one thing that we have as a field um, that, like, you know, nobody, like, you know, well, that's just not that, like, um, has, a as, has a field, so, like, you know, we have, like, you know, um, so LHC data is big data. Actually, the people don't like it when we call it big data, um, but it's data. Um, the second thing is we have these simulations. I talked about, and, and it is important that we have these precision simulations because if you combine those two, two, two questions, this is like a unique for our field. Big data, go to astro people, they have equally big data, right? I mean, Gaia has three billion stars or something, star spectra, this is also proper big, right? There's, I'm, not, I'm not complaining. But ask them like, to watch, uh, um, if they can actually say, like, simulate those or like, you know, understand them in terms of like, you know, fundamental physics, and the answer is like, no. <laughs> so, no, we cannot. Like, you know, so like, you know, this is some, in this combination, um, we, we, um, uh, LHC physics is unique. And then the last thing, like, you know, if you talk to other fields of physics or science, um, anything we do is about uncertainties. We do nothing ever without an error bar. Never, ever. Actually, forget about one error bar. Like, you know, a, a comprehensive error uncertainty treatment is how our experimental co 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 colleagues call this, right? So this is, if you want, um, what defines us, and then what we want, some fun fundamental answers out of this. Like, for instance, what's dark matter? Like, you know, where does the baryon and baryon symmetry come from? These kind of questions, right? We don't just do this, sorry, like, you know, to all kinds of, like, you know, I don't do this kind of stuff to measure some bloody Higgs coupling to W bosons a factor two better, right? I, this, is, this is, like, you know, way too much technical stuff, to, uh, fun, to actually then, like, deflate this great technique like, you know, just answer, okay, I can measure this, like, you know, the coupling effector too, but I don't care, 
right? I mean, I think like, you know, when we do these kind of things, we should keep, should, should keep in mind we do this. It's a lot of effort. It's like thousands of people working on this stuff. And the reason why we do this is because we have proper fundamental questions and they want for proper fundamental answers. Measuring couplings is a nice, like, you know, thing you can do if nothing else happens. But like, you know, I don't want that. And yes, in my group, we measure a lot of couplings that way. It's the best you can do. Okay, but let me start like, you know, with like, you know, um, machine learning and uncertainties. So let me like, you know, take that part here. Um, an introduction to how a physicist views neural networks. And I think the easiest way, because like, you know, at universities, we get told, like, you know, you have to, like, you know, pick people up where they stand. So, like, you know, I just you know, heard you stand, like, you know, where the fits are. So, let's, what's a fit? Let's just, like, you know, remember briefly what's a fit, right? A fit is, in my opinion, um, some kind of, like, you know, function. This is all my notation here. X is my whatever space, face space or something like this. This is, like, you know, functional values here, and then you have a bunch of points you measure here, right? And the fit is writing down a function and then using this function to, um, to describe these data points, right? And a good fit has uncertainty on the data points, right? And I mean, a good fit results, like, you know, goes through these data points roughly within the uncertainties. I mean, this is, is that just like, you know, in essence what a fit does, right? Okay. And formally, like, you know, what I'm going to write here is you have a training data set. And I'm just basically, like, you know, sneaking all the machine learning lingo now into the fit because it is literally the same. And, like, you know, like in a regular machine learning lecture where people don't know their particle physics and stuff, like, you know, that, like, you know, we probably have to explain all this. But, like, you know, here I can basically say, like, you know, all these pairs, X and F, numbered by, in my lecture notes, by, numbered by J, this is called a training data set. So I have, a bunch of, I have a bunch of data points which are described X and F, and this is my training data. Training data is the data that I want to use to, like, to, know, to, to get my fit result out. Okay, my fit here is um, describing, so like if I have an, um, in, in, in a functional behavior F of X here, which is like, you know, roughly, like, you know, I would write. So what I want to construct is I want a, a fit function F of X Described by model parameters, which I call in the machine learning lingo theta, theta, to approximate a function f of x, where this one here is my fit, my approximation here, and this here, that is um, the information encoded in the training data. So, like, you know, I don't have, this is the true function, which I don't know, but what I have here is I have the training data set and it approximates it, so it's implicitly known through the training data. So, this is implicitly known. You can know in truth. And for a fit as well as for a neural network, I don't know the truth. I only know samples that describe the truth, right? So I assume that my training data somehow describes the truth. Okay, um, that's my fit. And now you remember what you do with a fit, right? Um, you minimize something, a chi-squared, right? I mean, like, you know, basically, like, when you construct a fit, you, like, determine all the different parameters, theta, by minimizing a function, right? And that function is um, a chi-squared, it's a... It's a the, Hey guys, am I doing something wrong? No, no, no. No, I was going to provoke you. Yeah, provoke me. Come on. Because you're being, so the provoke, provocation about you know, these two religions and statistics, Bayesian and frequentist, the oh, yes. frequentist, but some people are Bayesian. Yes. So your whole approach is going to be frequentist? No. Okay. I will know. even use the B word in a second, <laughs> yes. Um, no, I will use the B word, and I, I, I will also use B's theorem in a second. Yeah, Bayes theorem. Yes, but you know, so it's, it's fine too. Uh, even a freak, we frequentists, we don't dispute the correctness of Bayes theorem. So, like you know, yes, no, no, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. Okay. I, I will even introduce a prior. So, like here, yeah. 
get that. Because in cosmology, we use Bayesian all the time. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I know. I'm very worried about that as well, yes. It's like, we just wrote a paper, by the way, showing like, you know, that the two of them not, are not equivalent when you actually do Higgs couplings. Yeah, but we can talk about this over coffee. Yes. So what we do is, so this chi-squared stuff. So what, like, you know, um, the, the chi-squared like we usually minimize is something like, you know, what is it? Um, you calculate, so like, you know, you have all seen this probably. You, you, you ca calculate the difference between fj, the training data point, as a function of x, um, and the prediction here, f theta, this is your model here, as a function of xj, right? Um, then you do a chi uh, squared of this, you divide this by the different, forget about, like I hope I get the factors right, the uncertainties, 2 sigma squared here, right? You sum over all your data points, j. Um, and yeah, um, you, uh, you would uh, maximize that or you would minimize that. So this is, um, this. now, what is, where does this come from? Like, you know, this is what we call chi-squared, right? So what this, where this really comes from, what, what this really comes from, it is, um, comes from a likelihood. It comes from, like, you know, a probability of the um, model in terms of the parameters theta describing the, the, the training data set. And what it is here is nothing but a, the logarithm, so like of a Gaussian likelihood. So what you, make, what you describe here is a likelihood measure. And that likelihood measure, measure like, you know, if you look at this, right, it is a, um, it's a logarithm of a Gaussian likelihood. This is like, you know, the exponential of a Gaussian. E to the minus, this is exactly what's in the Gaussian, right? And remember, likelihoods um, um, multiply when you take different, many measurements. The likelihood just multiply. All the log likelihoods just get summed. So what this is, is the log likelihood, and I changed the notation here yesterday. So this is the likelihood of my model here, describing the data set X using model parameters theta. I think this is the correct way of writing that. Now, you'll remind me, if you're cheeky, is that like, oh yeah, buddy, you're like missing a whole lot of prefactors here. Yeah. Like, you know, all, like, all kinds of constants. Okay, so like, you know, plus constant or minus constant. And to be more precise here, I'm ignoring everything that doesn't depend on theta. Because what I'm saying is that I want to minimize the chi-squared, maximize the likelihood. Oh, wait, oops. This is minus log. No, I think that should be. Um, I maximize uh, the, oh, Jesus Christ, I get this wrong all the time. So this is e to the minus. That is correct, right? So I am um, I'm maximizing the likelihood. I'm minimizing the minus, the negative log likelihood. So this is maximized. So I, if I want to call this, my, ling my lingo here in machine learning will be, will be um, a loss function. Then um, what I do is I minimize uh, let me say that. I maximize the likelihood ratio, maximize the likelihood, likelihood. Um, be careful, like, and this is a log likelihood, but a log is a monotonous function. I can ma maximize either the likelihood or log likelihood. That, that doesn't matter. Or, and that's important, you minimize a so-called loss function. This is how we call this in machine learning, a loss function. A loss function, or there's a million words, words for that. The thing that you minimize, the kind of equivalent of chi-squared. Yeah? Okay, this is essentially what people do when they do fits. Yes? Another provocation. You have to assume that the data is Gaussian distributed. Here, yes. Is there a way to go beyond this? Yes, I'll show you. Yeah, yeah. It, like, I, I, I will like, un unwrap this all, uh, eventually, but like, you know, this is what we typically do for the chi-squared. So when you do, whenever somebody says chi-squared, you, as Rogerio said, whenever you say chi-squared, it's always Gaussian. When people say likelihood, it might or might not be Gaussian. This formula is the Gaussian approximation. Right? And you don't have to use that. You can actually calculate the likelihood if you want. But it gets much worse, because what people do in machine learning, I like, you know, this is a dirty secret, um, is they don't do this. They basically, like, you know, machine learning comes from fields where they don't care, care about uncertainties or don't know, 
Oh shit, am I recording? <laughs> so machine learning is like, you know, a field where like uncertainties don't play a big role. And by the way, that is fine because, you know, if you're trying to like work for like Zalando in Germany, you're trying to sell shoes, you don't need an uncertainty on a prediction. Really do not, right? I mean, you optimize a system and, you know, your salespeople give you the feedback you need, right? I mean, you don't need an error bar on this. But for some applications, you need an error bar. So if you don't know the sigmas here, what do I do here? What do I, what do, I do then? Well, I assume that like, okay, I mean, in the very worst case, like, take this out, uh, make this like, you know, take like, you know, to take like, you know, an averaging here over that, replace that log, log, log likelihood by um, something like minus, minus one over two sigma squared, so we get the units right, if this thing has a unit, um, J, F, I, no, F, J, minus F theta of X, J, squared. So that's what people do machine learning, actually. So like, you know, this is like, you know, um, unfortunately, the truth, um, like, you know, in FITS, you are used to using, like, you know, uncertainties, and you're, you're used to, like, writing the likelihood and using chi-squared. And you look into machine learning, what they do is, like, you know, they take this thing, this is called mean squared error. And this is, like, the likelihood or like log likelihood without talking about uncertainties. So this is what you find normally in machine learning papers as the loss function. Uh, sigma is some number. It's not a no, no, no. For them, this one here, modulo some constant number, which could be the a typical, like, you know, mean average uncertainty on the data set, but, you know, it doesn't, there's no if impact on theta, right? I mean, it doesn't balance, it's, uh, it's just an overall factor. So this thing here will, it will go into a constant of S, a constant of theta, and it's gone. Right? So, you don't care. So this is like, you know, when we do machine learning, you'll read a lot about this, about like, you know, train the MSE, and every physicist reading these papers should at that point be suspicious. Because you should say, look, you know, I can like, you know, even in my like, you know, first year lab courses, I do chi-squared, and that is much better. Like by the time, like, you say, the chi-squared is always, it sounds like a cooking recipe, like, never say chi-squared, always say log likelihood. Because log likelihood, that sounds much more knowledgeable. Right? I mean, that sounds like you know what you're talking about. Chi-squared is like, you know, always like cooking recipe kind of stuff. But in machine learning, the people don't do this. So if I had to give the standard of machine learning introduction into neural networks, I would now start with an MSE. But I'm then, like, you know, I am a physicist, right? And um, so I have, like, certain scientific standards <laughs> that, that come from my education. And, like, it's not my fault. Like, you know, I mean, they're like, you know, we're like, you know, they... I mean, you know this, how this, like, you know, we, like, we teach you guys, like, you know, uncertainties and being careful stuff like you know from the first year and I don't want to like you know go under those like you know remove those standards so like you know we don't do this I cannot teach you some machine learning because I would have to talk about MSEs and I don't want to talk about MSEs so let me give you an introduction to machine learning where I start with the likelihood because that's much better one thing when you do MSE here the problem with this MSE now is if you think about it here you're replacing effectively your problem here the fit that you're still doing um, by the same problem where all the sigmas are the same size. If you make that assumption, you can take them out, it's all the same thing, right? Yeah. If you do that, kind of all points, modulo, like, you know, like, you know difference between relative and, and absolute uncertainties, all of these points are equally important, like, you know, they have all the same absolute uncertainty, right? So what you're doing, if you think about when you do use an MSE instead of a likelihood, what you're saying is every measurement has the same, the same absolute uncertainty. Then your chi-squared indeed becomes the MSE and you can use it, right? Thing is, from a physics perspective, that doesn't make a lot of sense, right? I mean, making that assumption doesn't make a lot of sense. In machine learning, it also doesn't make a lot of sense. So what people do then is um, they need other ways kind of balance these different, these, these, these different data points. So in machine learning, you will find um, that there is a great art in like basically redefining the variable x such that your fit works best. Redefining the variable x into log x, for instance, as a physicist, you would say, oh, you're just introducing a Jacobian, <laughs> right? But this is exactly what they're doing. Or they're like, you know, doing some standard scaling. They, like, they play a lot of, like, a lot of like, games with x 
because when you start with the MSE, you don't have any way to, um, to, to, um, to like weigh the importance of points relative to, the, to each other. So you need another way of doing this because it's in, in everyday science life, this happens, you, you want to weigh them. So um, what, experiment, what, what people do in machine learning a lot is instead of using um, um, the likelihood, they're using MSE, and then they do a rescaling, which effectively gives them um, some kind of a Jacobian. And the art of choosing the right, um, the right um, transformation and hence generating the best Jacobian is crucial for your, for your network output. It's called pre-processing done like to death. You look into this and it's super important. Why is it also super important? As a physicist, I said, like, yeah, it's clear it's super important, right? Because not, el not all points are, are equally good. And like, you know, I need some way to tell my network training, my loss function, which are important and which are not, if I don't want to use the likelihood. Okay, so that just was my just like little bit slightly critical remarks concerning people who don't do uncertainties. So I want to do, I'm going to do a network um, with you now. So by the way, I am following in the lecture notes um, on like one, two, two, fits in interpolation. Um, I want to write down a network that, um, oh, before I do that, um, just for language, when you um, do a fit, remember that when you, a fit function will not go, I mean, will not go through all the data points, right? It, it'll just like, you know, find a good way to like, you know, approach every data point well enough such that the, local, the likelihood as a global thing of, for instance, slightly noisy data will be, will be the likelihood will be, will be maximized or the, the, the chi-square will be minimized yeah? or the loss will be minimized. Does anybody know what, like, what do I do with, with the data set where I know it's not noisy and I want to hit the data points? Apply interpolation. Exactly, you do the interpolation, right? Comparing a fit and interpolation is actually very, very useful in terms of machine learning because what's the difference between a fit and an interpolation? And let's assume that the data is noisy because otherwise there might be no difference. But if my data is noisy, what happens um, when I do an, an, an interpolation? I'm forcing my, this, my function f. I can derive a f theta of x when I can think of like the spline as an f theta of x, right? Um, does anybody, everybody know what a spline is? Okay, a spline is, um, is just a function. I'm rewriting my data, same thing here. Data points here, here, let me make it a little widey. So the, the, a spline is essentially a description to get from point to point, hitting every single one of them under certain assumptions. So the easiest spline would be linear. You basically do this, right? Um, that is a description, it's a closed form. I can think of this as f theta, right? Um, but you, the way you think about, about, about this as f theta right now is like, you know, that it hits all your data point exactly and it doesn't average out. So clearly this has nothing to do with the likelihood. The con what, what you do to construct this, these splines is you really hit, like, you know, with a certain uh, closed form, you're hitting every data point. Now, um, as I said, obviously the, 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 um, the, the spline, the linear um, is, is, is not good. Right? Because you can't different, differentiate. And like, you know, we might want to have our formulas differentiable at least once. Um, so what you, do, what you can do now is you can um, smoothen this thing out a little bit. And if you think mathematically what you're doing here is you're you're, you're, instead of just requiring that the functional form of this closed form here and that closed form here, like you know, hitting this point, you also now you can um, you can you can choose the function as form, form such that the first derivatives are also the same if you like you know calculate them from above and from below from above and from below, right? Then your function will be differentiable once, right? So this is a spline like you know like and then you can do second derivatives and third derivatives and then your resulting function is a closed form and um, it'll be differentiable. However, there's one big difference and that is. Um, when you now generalize the whole thing. So now this is the training data and in machine learning what we use a second term is called the test data, the test data set. The test data set is a set that corresponds to your training data set. However, it's statistically independent. So same physics, but different like you know, ideally different um, 
the different um, um, uh, 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 random numbers behind it. So what happens now for a fit, right? You want your fit to perform on the training data set, on the test, test data set equally well. Then you have a good fit. If a training, um, if, if a fit behaves better on the training data set on the, than on the test data set, you have learned statistical fluctuations here, not the physics, right? And then, yeah, well, you will try to like, you know, find the statistical fluctuations from the training data set in the test data set, but they're not there because that data set has, test data set has its own statistical fluctuations, they're different, so you don't find them there, right? So this is what we call overtraining. And this is one of the like important steps in machine learning. You check training data set, test data set, are they equally good? Yes? Yes. And if the, yes. Why do we do this? Why don't you just optimize the best data set for this? Oh, so what you want here is, this is called the generalization error. So you want your network um, to be, uh, like, no, like, forget about the network. You want your fit. You still at fits, but right? same thing for network. You want your fit to, to be um, the function here, f theta, right? f theta of x. Um, you want that object here to be extracted from this from the from the training data set right but you do not you, you want this fit function to describe the physics not the statistical limitations of that data that, that data set so the way you in, incorporate that is to say well if i take another data set which has other statistical limitations right I, 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 I force my description f theta of x to be equally good for both of them given the same chi squared for instance if you overtrain, like you know, if you start um, getting like you know too good a result here by fi by, by fitting the statistical fluctuations, then your chi squared calculated on this data set, training data set, and the test data set will diverge, and that's bad. You don't want that. Well, you might, because if you now th so in machine learning you don't want this. If you think about this though, I mean we do a lot of interpolation in physics, right? Like you know, for instance, if our data is not noisy and so on and so forth. So now, like you know, as a as a physicist, um, it's an interesting question to ask, right? Like this thing here is clearly hugely overfitting in the sense that now, I mean, a spline has hit every point arbitrarily precisely. Clearly, does not generalize um, to the to the um, to, to 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 a test data set. A spline is a huge over huge overfitting if you want to think about it, right? Um, in machine learning, the general wisdom is don't overfit. In physics, sometimes we want a spline. Sometimes there are data points, maybe not all of them, but like sometimes there are data points I really want my network to hit, right, or my fit to get right. right. So that we need to think about this a little bit. As physicists, we need to think about that. And then we can relate this to uncertainties. Yeah. So, in any case, so this is what we do, like, you know, we minimize a, a loss function, and then we try this on the training data set, and we try the same thing on the loss function on the test data set, and uh, if they don't, uh, if they, like, you know, roughly agree, then we have a nicely generalizing function, and f, our f theta of x is all there for the fit. Now, when you think about this f, of f theta of x now, um, I mean, if you have done all, you have, all have done fits, you're looking at the output of your fit program, and you see that you have model parameters. Think a polynomial fit, like you know, you have five parameters in front of like you know the constant x, x squared, x, x cubed, and so on and so forth, right? And all of them come with an uncertainty, right? Every model parameter in your in your in your fit has an uncertainty. Like your, your fitting code gives you that uncertainty. It corresponds to the uncertainty of the data set, and it comes out as an, with an uncertainty, right? Um, so my point would be. If I now think about a network being nothing but a very high dimensional fit, like you know, a non parametric fit, I want the same. I want my uncertainties. I, want, I, I don't want from a, from a network less than I get from a fit. I don't want an MSE. I want a likelihood. I don't want just like some parameters. I want parameters with uncertainties. I'm going to spend the rest of the lecture today deriving like, you know, how one, should, how one does that. 
But before, before we do that, let's just write down like, you know, how such a network in general works. Like, you know, how is a network constructed from a physics perspective? Okay, a network, what does it do? I already showed, wrote it down, a neural network. Network is really just a fit where theta is not five-dimensional, but like, you know, a million-dimensional. So you have a, a million parameters. Imagine I can write down a description of a function that maps x here to my beloved f theta of x. Um, well, x is somehow d-dimensional, whatever. Um, f is just a real number, like just a simple example. So now I want a high-dimensional data set, and I want to extract something from that data set, right? Think of all kinds of jet measurements and the transverse momentum of the parton, right? I mean, really, that's kind of thing. How, how would I do that? Like, you know, how would I write this down? Um, so how would I write a network? And the way, like, you know, I would think about this as a physicist, I'd like, okay, like, you know, I want some, forget about the dimensionality, right? I want to somehow map x to f to a function of theta of x, right? And I'm, I, I want to do some very basic math, simple math, right? So one way of do, uh, doing that is I could define myself um, some kind of standard building block of my network that goes from x, maps x here, to a variation of x, slightly like, you know, shifted around, shifted some more, right? Shifted some more. I call this capital N here, and that will be the output. This is inspired by Taylor series to me, right? I mean, like, you know, like in, in physics, we think a lot about, like, you know, if I can describe a mapping or like a function in, as a whole thing, like, you know, why don't I choose like some intermediate steps and describe a function just like, you know, as a, as a whole chain of mappings. Yeah? That's the fundamental building blocks. And these things are like, you know, somehow like standard building blocks. And they shouldn't be too complicated. We construct one in a minute. So this is the idea of a neural network. These things are called network layers. Right? I'm making, I'm trying to construct a very complex mapping by like, you know, putting a lot of like, you know, layers one after the other, after the other, after the other, after the other, such that to get from here to here, from here to here, from here to here, I can make my, my form, my, 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 my step very simple. Okay. Simple? We know how simple goes, right? In physics, simple is Taylor series, <laughs> right? So, like, let me just write with my x here n plus 1. So I, I, I go from n to n plus 1 by defining, um, oh, actually, I wrote this here x n minus 1 gets mapped to x n. I'm going to stick to my, my notation here. So my x n minus 1 get, gets mapped to x n, and that is nothing but some kind of a matrix. And, and this is just de de defined in the certain layer um, times, this is a vector, right? I mean, so n minus 1, right? And just to be nice to the function b n. But right. you have this is n-dimensional. I told you this we have to do, and the simplest building block I can write down to do this. The universal building block is like if I agree with myself that I want to do these building blocks, and I tailor them. I make this like you know, make that a nice like you know linear function, or a fine as we call it if it has these things. Okay, now you can write down the you know, all these network parameters and so on and so forth. Like you know, that means at every like you know layer here. Like, you know, every layer has a certain number of parameters, and these parameters are like, you know, um, like, you know, n values of the W matrix that you get out of here, um, um, plus, like, you know, one value of the, of this, of the bias, we call it B. Um, and then you have this, like, you know, four D entries in every, um, every um, that, that, like, you know, form my vector here. So, like, you know, you have this, um, at the end of the day, you have a vector that you map on another, another vector with D squared entries here in the matrix. And... Uh, D biases. Sorry, can you generalize to a non linear uh, Yeah, why the second? Sorry. Second, 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 you, you are too smart for, like, for the world. No, sorry, okay. So, I can, first of all, I can do this, right? Okay, sorry for 
<laughs> so, no, no. No, no, it's fine. So it's good. It's good. Good, good. So these things are fine contact. So this is, by the way, like now, this is, the, I, I, I'm, this is my amusing, but by the way, my standard joke. Sorry to this. Now you write this down, and some mathematically minded smart ass in the audience <laughs> will point out to you that this isn't a fine transformation, and you can actually do an, an, an affine, like any chain of affine transformations, and they will prove that this thing is a group. And now you're screwed, because that means you can pile, pile as many affine um, layers on top of each other, and you will still get just an affine, an affine um, I mean, you can actually uh, an affine mapping. So what it, this mapping here is a little too stupid. It doesn't work. Why? Because it's a group. You can also do it by hand and show that it is, like, you know, uh, it's two successive affine transformations are just an affine transformation, which means I can, with this network, describe any functional behavior as long as it is affine or linear, which is not good enough, right? Let's, even for particle physics, that's not good enough. So I want something more complicated, right? I want to benefit from that. So what do I do? Well, I think, well, this is um, nice. But I need something that's just this little bit smarter and no extra work, right, here. So if I want this mapping to be not affine, a little bit smarter, less linear, not a lot of work, why don't I write some, what's a, what's a nice, nice, a nice, um, a nice nonlinear function made? The maximum function. The maximum is clearly not a linear function. So basically, if I take my here, uh, my, my function um, as the maximum function of 0 and xj, which is thus defined as 0 for xj, smaller than 0 and like xj for xj, larger than 0, right? That's nonlinear. And this is about the simplest nonlinear function I can write down, right? I mean, everybody can calculate this. And then the whole thing, thing be, being machine learning, they give this a name. It's called Relu. It's um, the, I always forget what it's called, rectified linear unit, or max. <laughs> so what I do here is I replace x n minus 1 here. I place that, that relation here of x n by the Relu of that, or the max of my linear function, my affine transformation. Yes? Are we sure that by assuming this transformation, this value function, we will like, map to all non-linear functions? No. This is actually a very, very complicated mathematical proof. Like, no, this is to show that, I mean, OK. First of all, just one second. First of all, this works, right? Now, if I take that, this is not affine anymore, right? So now, I certainly have a much larger class of functions I can, I can express. This is the simplest construction right, I can write down, and this is nothing but a deep neural network standard. Look, look in the literature, like, you know, all about this brain and stuff, brain cells. But this is really what, that, what we are doing. We are taking a mapping, I'll come to your question in a second. We're taking a mapping, x to f of x, we're splitting this up into, like, you know, parts which are like, you know, like, um, standardized. These parts we approximate with the simplest thing you can write down, a linear function. And because that doesn't work, because that thing has a group structure, like, you know, we put a max function in front. And now the question is, can we, can we, um, can, can we like, you know, what kind of classes for functions can I, can I describe? And there is, like, you know, uh, proofs. Um, I forget what they are. There are proofs that, in principle, when you make this, the network arbitrarily deep with an arbitrary large number, then you, um, then you can describe any function you want with this kind of setup. Now, in practice, I mean, you know, this is the opposite of the original criticism that you can only do affine things. So that was useful, right? Um, at the end of the day, um, I think these like proofs are not super useful because like, you know, what happens is it, it says like for an arbitrary number of, of um, of layers you can express any function, except that they also tell you an arbitrary number of layers you cannot actually find, like, you know, define your function. You will not never find your theta values anymore. So, okay, mathematically interesting, fine. 
But it's about as interesting, you know, in quantum field theory, right? If everybody tells you that, like, you know, you can do perturbation theory. And when you do strict, like, you know, math, then you know the radius of a perturbation theory in that quantum field theory is zero, um, the radius of convergence, right? Yeah, it still does okay, <laughs> right? I mean, so mathematically, there's like, there's like, you know, extensive theorems about this, but actually, honestly, I don't think they're particularly useful. Unlike the opposite case, where you know, like, you know, you listen a bit of my math and this and that, this is pointless, right? So this is my introduction to, to, to neural networks, because that's it. Like, you know, this is my neural network. That's it. That's all there is. Simple layer structures. These things are called nodes then later. And um, layers are just basically affine mappings. And because an affine group uh, is, an, is a group, um, you need something else. Then you put in the simplest nonlinear function. And now I have a function that is described. Theta here now corresponds to all the Ws and Bs which are in my network. And I said that that could be a million of them, right? And now I've, I, I need a data set for which I use the concept, lag in a fit, the loss function, to find the best values of theta. That's it. No network training, right? Test all the same. There's absolutely nothing much magic about it. All there is is it's, it's essentially this is the function we fit. For everybody has done a fit, this is the function we fit. And we describe it by the thetas, which I will not, I, I forget about like, you know, the details of it, like, you know, like you know, if you do want to do a tutorial, you'll find this. But these thetas are just the Ws and Bs, and I'll call them theta in the future. That's all there is. Like, you know, kind of demystified a little bit. It has nothing to do with the brain. I mean, like any physicist, like, you know what? I mean, I mean, we clearly cannot use a constant function here, so linear is the simplest we can do. Like, you know, and we do our, like, nice, like, you know, piece by universal layer structure. Okay, and then, here, of course, at the end of the day, like, you know, these matrices don't, are not always diagonal because, you know, this is one-dimensional and this is b-dimensional. So, like, you know, you have to write this down, but, like, it's obvious how you would do this. And then, really, any network I'll talk about in this week has this form. Any network you can think about with the possible exception with like, you know, um, the reinforcement learning, which I'm not going to talk about because it's quite complicated, but like any network has this very simple structure. Everything I'll do this week. It's always x mapped to some kind of function. And then we can discuss what that function means. But at the end of the day, it's just a fit, a non-parametric fit, to a very simple mathematical structure. There's nothing fancy about it. Why does this work? It works the same reason why, like, you know, QCD is so successful for LHC physics, right? Because we can, like, you know, do NQBLO calculations, right? This is, like, why it works. So we can actually, we have tools numerically to, do, to deal with the complexity. And the same thing is true here. The reason that works is because nowadays, with deep learning, we can actually put, like, you know, I don't know, 10, 20, or 30 layers. And that means we can describe stuff. But if you couldn't do this, I mean, if you were like, just had one or two layers, you'd also be dead. Right? So this very simple ansatz will work. And we make it work through brute force numerics. Yes? Uh, I have a very stupid question. So does it mean that you cannot describe variables, but can be negative? Because you always, you know, you always take a positive Oh, um, no, I think that, the, 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 the actually, when you actually set it up, you can, you can, of course, you can describe stuff negative. But also, um, we'll talk about this a little bit. This is a trick about part of these, like, you know, um, that's a part of the, the mapping, right? I mean, um, these are the, 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 the weights here that, put, that, can, that can be positive or negative, but you can also shift them because they live in an unbounded space. And the same thing, this function here, you can, if, you, if you don't like it, you can switch it. And, and like, you know, this is exactly this pre-processing processing stuff. But in principle, no, you can't do that. You can, you can insert, insert a minus sign, effectively, and then you do minus redo. Yeah? So, that's my network. Yeah? For instance, yes. No, you don't. I, I don't know anything that's practical. I think in, in, in the equivalent measure here is always training and test. But because if you actually change your hyperparameters, it's, um, 
Um, the, 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 it's not clear that the actually loss function of the chi-squares are um, numerically comparable. So the easiest way is run, um, or the fastest way of run it on a test data set. Sorry, how many layers is needed to get to a successful sample? That depends very much on your, on your, um, on your, on your problem. I mean, professional stuff, um, like, you know, like image recognition, Google, I know 100, 200, like lots, lots. In our group, 10, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> something like this. I mean, 30 is huge. And it, it depends, like, you know, like, you know, making the network deeper makes it harder to train, right? Because it's, you know, if you think about it, just one second, if you think about it, you're making this, like, you know, this, like, you know, little expansion in layers, right? And to a given uncertainty that you care about, there is a good number of layers. And beyond that, your thing can just fluctuate because it can dump the job on, of layer two on four and seven and 80, 89 and so on, this becomes very unstable. So you want few layers, um, just enough layers. Yes? I'll show you in a second. <laughs> um, two things to start, you, you essentially look at the, the value of the loss function. You look at the chi-square. I'll, I'll derive that in a second. If you do the MSE, I don't know how you stop. If you don't. But if you look at the chi-squared, if you, if you write down a likelihood loss, then you know what to look at. But yes? Do we have any, like, I don't know, if we say our function is well-behaved, whatever that means, uh, does anybody tell us this is the maximum number that you need of these? No. Okay. I mean, this is, this is intuition <laughs> or playing with it. So, so theorem, what's the... No. Um, as a matter of fact, um, you can save yourself layers I, by choosing um, different um, nonlinearities, right? I mean, so what we find um, even in our, like, you know, studies, like we recently had a paper where, like, you know, checking di different, using different nonlinearities, some work much better than others. So there is no, up, no, there is no like, absolute result, uh, like answer to this. That depends on the details and on the level of, and on the level of precision you're aiming for. Um, oh, <laughs> good question. Um, almost all, well, I mean, almost, almost, almost all the networks that we look at have more parameters and data points. This is why we are so careful with, uh, with, with, um, with, um, with um, overtraining. All of them can, like, you know, have the power, like, you know, all, this is why you have to be so careful with overtraining. So, like, you know, you, yeah, you, you know, a normal network has more, has more um, parameters than data points. A lot. Right. And, what you check for when and this is why you need to do this overtraining check. When otherwise, you can, you, can, you, know, you can always add more parameters. At some point, they might not help you. But you see, sometimes they do help you because you know, like, you know, the network settles, and then the others you don't care about. Um, but then you have to, do, to check the overtraining. Overtraining for a fit is because we have fewer parameters usually. Like, you know, it's not, but even for fitting, actually, we always pay attention to overfitting. But for networks, that's crucial. But it's nothing than overfitting a fit. Same thing. It's called overtraining. No. Okay. Then we have a little bit of time for my loss function or my network for physicists. So this was the physicist's explanation what a network is. Now here comes the physicist's ex explanation how, how do I train a network. And by the way, this is not by physicists. That's actually by a bunch of... Um, people like from statistics, but um, now come the Bayesian comes in. So what I want is, I want, let's, uh, let's assume I want my, my function here, my f theta of x, I want this to approximate a function of f of x. And to make, to make this just like a little bit more like, you know, physics friendly, like identify these things, uh, this function with a transition amplitude of an LHG scattering, really like this, like, you know, the transition amplitude PP goes to, like we did, two photons and two jets, or two photons and one jet. And then this is the transition amplitude, m squared, and it depends on phase space x. And the phase space is order of magnitude, like 15 dimensional. Right? I mean, this is like, you know, so you can imagine something. Right? So now, what I want my network to do is, given x, 
I want my network to give me an amplitude, right? Strictly speaking, um, what the network will have learned is not like you know, an amplitude value. I'm, I'm omitting the, the, the variable x. No, no, uh, x is all for now all omitted. What I want is like for a given point in parameter space, I want my network, because I'm a physicist, not to actually know the absolute value of the amplitude, because that could be noisy. The, you know, there could be numerical like, you know, um, fluctuations, because I'm calculating this through loop calculator inter -com computations. So instead of giving me an amplitude value, I want my network to somehow encode a probability distribution, like you know where this amplitude might sit, right? P of A. I mean, like this. This is X. Right? I mean, it has a certain width. Okay, and if I now want to know the amplitude of for 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 um, given this P of P of A, what I need to do is I need to do the expectation value as of this D A. And this is an expectation value. I think we all agree on that, but this is just basically what you do all the time. So if you say my amplitude, and this is the, new, the, the thing that I'm doing here that's not a standard like machine learning, is I'm, uh, I want my network to learn a probability distribution for the amplitude, allowed amplitude values at the phase space point x. And x I'm omitting here. x is over because everything I write has argument x. Everything depends on x. Okay. Now, this P of X is encoded in the network, right? So how, would the, how, how, do, how should I think about this? Well, um, yeah, my network has parameters theta, right? You have Ws and Bs. And now, if I come from a fit, then all of these thetas have distribution, probability distributions, right? They have like you know, a mean and they have a standard deviation. And ideally, if you don't make them a Gaussian assumption, they have a distribution. You can make that Gaussian, but you don't have to make this Gaussian. So what I have here is my, my, um, my thetas have, have a distribution. And now all I want to do, and the theta distribution is basically determined by the training. So like, you know, let me call this, these are distributions giving the training data. Right? This is how it fixes. This is the only occurrence of x. So this is not when I evaluated this, my training data. OK, now how do I get from my P of theta to P of A? Well, this is just condition probabilities. What I also need is somehow magically that. And then it's all defined, right? So what I need is I need my network weights as part of the training to get a certain like distributions in my weight space theta, right? And then I need my network to translate those thetas into amplitudes, right? And if, my, if I then just you know, sample over theta, I get this probability distribution of the amplitudes. So what I have done is I have translated the probability distribution of over amplitudes into, the, into a probability distribution over thetas. Through this, is, this is just a transition um, factor. OK, and here comes, um, like, you know, something like, you know, mathematical. So um, a little bit like, you know, how do I think about training a network now? I mean, this, the problem with this stuff here is um, that, yeah, OK, this is, can be encoded in the network, and, you know, but, like, you know, whatever. Like, you know, I don't know these, <laughs> that one. I can't write it down, right? I mean, I'm indicating with X training data that I can somehow, through my minimization, I can probably link the training data um, uh, properties to theta, theta distribution, but this is all going to be implicit. This is all going to be hidden in the, in the, in the data set, right? I, th that corresponds to, I don't know what my f of x is. I only know data points, right? So, and this is like, you know, formally when people like think about like, you know, um, training a network. Actually, let me just continue this here. So now, when you think about like, you know, what, what do I do when I do a, I want, when I, I want a network? I want my network, in general, to give me this P of A, right? I want this thing here to be encoded, and I want these distributions here to be somehow extracted from the training data, right? And then be encoded in the network and generalized to test data. Which means at the end of the day, what I want is I want to approximate, like here, this one here, I want to approximate this integral here with an integral that, like, you know, describes my 
network. And let me just call this Q of theta. What's crucial is my training means I want to somehow, under this integral, I only train on the amplitudes. I want under this integral, this distribution of the network's parameters, given the training data, to be encoded as a distribution of, over, over, over these parameters that apply for training data and test data and everything. All right? So I want the training data here. I want to, uh, to, I want to use that to describe if you want a training data independent distribution of the thetas. I mean, this is like a little bit of a mathematical trick if you think about it. But this is like, you know, this is what my, in, this, in this language network training means. And the network training that generalizes. So I have an integral, I have a description of the networks that describe, that, that, that like, you know, describe, give me the right, the probability distribution for the amplitudes given the training data. Right? But I want this to be used not just on the training data, but, but on any data set I want to choose, which means that thing has to drop out. So the assumption is that the training data is representative. Of exactly. The exactly. This is supposed to be representative, but it's not equivalent. And what, I'm, what I mean is I want an approximation of this P of theta given the training data, independent of the training data is Q of theta, equally applicable to training data and test data. Remember, I don't actually have that. I only have it in the data set. I can evaluate this integral. I have all the amplitudes, right? But I only have it in the training data set. This thing here is called, by the way, a variational approximation. Then, just a technical term. And this is what the training, uh, what training in network does for me. Okay, if I want to do this, what I need is I need to somehow, in, min, in, now in my min, minimization, right, this is going to be my train network. I need to find a function Q of theta that's encoded in the network, right? So that has to be on the loss function. I want this to, under this integral here, basically behave like P of theta given the training data, which is something that I only have in terms of my sample. It's, I mean, it, it, this information exists, but not explicit. But by sampling, I can extract it. Right? So I want two distributions to agree when sampled <laughs> or over a certain sampling procedure. This is a, like, you know, a, a mathematical question that's actually well defined that like, physicists typically don't know about. I mean, there's a few, big fat field about this. Like, and it's called optimal transport. Um, if, you, if, if I read about it, optimal transport. And this entire field is about how to compare distributions. And I have a very specific question. I have a very specific question, namely, how can I somehow construct um, a function q that resembles p under this integral, and I don't have it explicit, I can only sample it. And like you know, the simplest recipe that you find in optimal transport theory is called a kullback leibler divergence. This is called KL divergence. And it says, well, write down two functions and then um, just to compute the, the functional, which I call here Q of theta. And the second function is my P of theta x training. So right, I mean, this is what I know from what I know from sampling. And construct the following object. That's a big expectation value. The log of the two. Um, Q of theta divided by P of theta given X training. And this evaluated now, and now I have to choose. <laughs> I have, um, have two samples, like, you know, I have two distributions, right? So like, you know, I can sample them however I want, but la no, naively I would probably want to sample it either following this or that distribution to make things simple. Because the KL average is really just the simplest thing to do. Right. Turns out the one that we want here, they, 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 they exist. They're, one is called forward, the other one backward. I always forget which one is which. But let me, like, you know, I want to say I want to do that. And let me write this out for you because, you know, this is the kind of not very handy way of writing it. So what I want to calculate here is the integral d theta, q of theta. This is the sampling here times what I want to sample. This is this, this 
ratio. P of theta given the training data. Yeah, right, so that's, that's more object I want to work with mathematically. So this is all very mathematical, but I think it's like really the only way to understand, like, you know, to understand what a network does proper. Okay, so this is my KL divergence. My KL divergence, as I said, like there's nothing, well, there's lots of deep stuff about it, but it really, for what we use it for here is simply, I have two distributions, I want to compare them by sampling. And you, if you type this into Google properly, KL divergence, and simplest recipe, KL divergence comes out. It's not by, by no means the only one. But it's fast, and it does the job. Now, if you think about it, you have to be a little bit careful, right? So, if the KL divergence vanishes, there's two ways it can vanish, right? First of all, if a P and Q is the same everywhere, then the log here is a log 1, it's a 0, and it's all this integral will vanish, right? The cheap way to vanish is, well, it's um, this log here, it might be small at some places, it might be big at some places, but where this log is big, Q of theta is small, right? And then this is also zero. So, like, you know, you have to be a little bit careful numerically with the, with the KL divergence because it is defined over a sample here, and it tests the agreement of those two functions in the part of the, like, theta space that, that you sample. This is the, always the weakness when you sample, right? And this is like, you know, where this field of optimal transport is out, so how, how do I get out of this? You later come to the, to the point where, like, you know, basically you can also do this sample from that, maybe, and then you have the other KL divergence, or then you can do the average of the two, and so like, you can start building up more complicated measures, but this is really the simplest one. Yeah? And that's called KL divergence. KL divergence is, like, ubiquitous in, in machine learning. You find it absolutely everywhere. And now, the, like, if I'm willing to take that thing here, as a measure of those two distributions, then I can write my training, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, um, uh, my training condition, because what, what I then want to do is, it follows me really. Um, <laughs> hello? Okay, um, yeah, so like, you know, my training of the network is then just like, you know, P and, P and Q, like, you know, compare them here using the KL divergence, write down, like, you know, this integral, um, make that small. And remember, from our fitting, the thing that we make small is the loss function. Okay, here's my loss function that we, we're going to simplify later, but like, you know, this is, um, like, you know, what we're going to do is, so the loss function here, or the minimization, or what replaces our chi-squared, is um, this KL divergence. Let me write this, oh, let me write this. Ah, Jesus, wait. I just want to continue up here. Here comes the experience of a university guy equals. <laughs> um, so, like, I'm just doing the calculation. Um, here, I'm following this, for following this integral. Now, the trick for the kind of net networks that I want to train, like, you know, to be able to, 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 to evaluate these things, you see, this is a probability of theta given um, the training, dis training data distributions. That's a little bit hard to calculate. I, I don't know how to get my hands on that, right? But if you think about it, if I could instead generate data, my training data, given my network parameters by moving the network parameters around, right? Like, you know, if, I, if instead of like P of theta given X training, I could evaluate P X state training data given, like, you know, theta, I could work with that. Okay, now how do I get from this to that? Well, this is Bayes' theorem, right? I know how to do this. I can, like, I can do this mathematically sound. So I can write down this, the same formula in a smart, much, much easier to handle way. Um, this is called log. Um, Q of theta remains. And then you, like, you know, do Bayes' theorem. So in the denominator now, you have the training data that you want to reproduce with your parameters, theta. Um, and then, well, you have P of theta p of theta. This is now like, you know, unfortunately, you're now like, you're, you're under the spell of Bayes. So like, you know, you have this p of the training data. So what do we have? We have introduced this likelihood that's better than this. So we want to, I can work with that. So that's going to be good for me. 
Um, this is just the same. This is what I want to, like, you know, what, what I want to learn. Then here, um, this is like P of X training data. Well, I mean, aside from the fact that that has nothing to do with the network, right? This is like, you know, this is called the evidence. And if I had to calculate, it would be a pain in the butt. But you know what? I'm just minimizing that thing. And you're going to see in a second that, like, you know, hey, everything that doesn't depend on theta, I can forget about. So luckily, I can, like, carry this evidence through. You can think about the, you know, the, this evidence just being the kind of the function that ensures that this is a properly normalized probability distribution. And I don't care about it. Important. I don't care about it. It exists. It makes things normalized. But I don't care about it. And this one here's a prior. So I have bought myself this simplification by having to write on a prior. And this is like, you know, the, this, is, the, this is kind of the Bayesian hell, right? I mean, this is Bayesian hell. You try to do something nice and smart and like, you know, concise, and you inherit yourself a prior. And we'll see what that does for machine learning, because for machine learning, it actually does something good. Unlike in cosmology, where like, you know, the prior is trying to guess how smart your colleagues are that you ask about your parameter. Um, here, it actually gives us something constructive and nice, and something to work with. OK, so um, I can write this thing here. You're almost done. So the first thing, I, I'm going to simplify this, like just this ratio. The first thing I write down is, um, Q of theta, and since we were talking about the prior, let's get rid of this. Log Q of P over P, um, in, uh, sampled over Q, is by my definition nothing but the KL divisions of Q and P. Right? Q of theta, P of theta. So I have my first attempt to hide the prior is given a different name. Let it vanish in the, in the KL divergence. This is nothing but like, you know, the KL divergence between that term and that term. And with that, these two are gone. Then, next, I want to deal with is um, the um, likelihood term, because that's a good one. I want that. So this is a minus integral d theta q of theta log p of the x training data given theta. That's nice. That's just a likelihood term. Like, you know, this is like, you know, a log likelihood. That's pretty much what you remember from the fitting function, except that it's not something I know in a closed form. I'm now sampling it over, over my model. Right? But aside from that, this is nothing but a log likelihood. You can make that Gaussian or not, depending on your taste for Gaussians. And then you have this, um, the, the, the evidence here, which is, well, it doesn't even depend on, the train, uh, on, on, on theta. So it's the evidence of the training data times the integral d theta q of theta. If you look into this, into this loss function, what you see is, well, this term here, as I said, like, you know, that doesn't depend on theta. I mean, here the actually theta appears, but think what that is. This is the normalization of my distribution over my network functions. So for every, every network parameter, I get a distribution Q of theta, and that I integrate over, right? And later on, what we'll do is we'll, like, you know, ask our network to, for instance, assume these things to be Gaussian or some other distribution of your choice, but in our case, Gaussian. In any case, like, we can ensure that this normalization here, um, that, you know, that, that integral is 1, just by choosing the right parameterization on our network of Q. And if you do that, we can forget about it, because then the, that thing has nothing to do with. So this, like, you know, let's, let, let, let this ensure to be 1. And then P train is something that um, it's just the evidence, and I told you, like, it's necessary mathematically, but we don't need it. So forget about it. I don't need this for my minimization. No, it's interesting, uninteresting from a theta perspective. Okay, then I have two terms left. Yeah, and I mean, those now, I need to calculate. <laughs> There's only so much I can do. Just let me just, like, briefly, like, you know, this is, like, you know, my loss function. After all, this is my minimization, my loss function. Briefly, like, think about, like, you know, so what, what did I do? i saying this KL divergence here, I minimize. I calculate it as one, one term here, whatever, this KL divergence, the prior term here. And then I have the other thing that's my, my, my likelihood, that's my regular likelihood loss, and something I have to forget. Now, if you throw this away, typical trick in machine learning, you can do that because it doesn't depend on theta. However, 
then your loss is not going to go to zero, right? I mean, this thing, this open, the, the KL divergence is guaranteed to go to zero if these things are equal. Now, you're throwing this away because it's independent of theta, but it is finite. So, like, exactly the kind of the original function of the, like, evidence making this, um, making this probability distribution here properly normalized um, um, is it, reflected now in the same term here, making sure that your loss function for a perfectly trained network is zero. If you forget about it, it will hit a well-defined minimum, but it's not zero, right? Just to be careful. So you cannot explain this, this, this uh, expect this loss to be zero. Um, yeah, that you can do. And um, that actually is well-defined. It's called like elbow. Um, the, 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 it's, um, wait, do I have it here? Yeah, it's called the evidence lower bound. It's a well-defined number, so your loss approaches the evidence lower bound. Yeah, just not, not zero. Okay. Um, this is actually my loss function of my network. And here comes the second best burst naming disaster of today. People who invented these networks called them bloody Bayesian networks, Bayesian neural networks. And why? Because they used bloody Bayes' theorem. Like, you know, like as if Bayes' theorem had anything to do with Bayesian. <laughs> like, I mean, yes, like, in some fields, these were invented probably in Cambridge and stuff, like where people thought like calling something Bayesian was a great thing. Like, you know, Bayesian means better. Like it's the same B. Um, in particle physics, it's not like this, right? We don't like calling it Bayesian. So this is the second naming disaster. These networks are not Bayesian at all. In no way are they Bayesian, but we'll talk a little bit about this term here. They're not Bayesian at all. They're just like networks with a proper, like, you know, distribution of the, of the theta parameters. Um, that, like, you know, allow you to track uncertainties, which is a very un-Bayesian thing to do, really. And, um, and so they track uncertainties, and they give you a likelihood loss for, the, for, for your network, right? So this is the likelihood loss. Loss. Um, and this here is a big question mark, and we'll, let's, let, let, let's write this down. So, like, you know, this is the last thing I want to do today is like, you know, how do I, what do I learn, how can I learn something about this, this first term? Um, well, it's actually not that hard. Um, let's go and make these two, two things here Gaussian, just for the heck of it, right? I will want to do, make, make this Gaussian and simplify the distribution here of all my, my network distributions anyhow, and I'm gonna use the same trick that I use for the simplified, um, the ReLU, in the sense that I'm just assuming this is Gaussian and I stack enough layers and so I can make the network complicated enough that this approximation has no effect on my result. But let's make, 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 write down the Gaussian, Gaussian KL divergence. And you can write this down and it's um, called, um, let's give you the formula. Um, I'm not gonna derive this. So if, I, if my Q is described by mu and sigma, and P is defined by, by mu and sigma, so these are just the same function as here, just I'm assuming that both of them are Gaussian, then I can calculate the KL divergence, and you can just, with a little bit of time, sigma Q squared plus sigma P squared plus mu P Q minus mu P whole thing squared divided by, whole thing divided by two sigma P squared um, plus a log secret Nasty log here. Okay, so this is my KL divergence. Now, um, what happens if I go from my like so-called Bayesian network that actually has these distributions of A and here the distributions of theta? What happens if I go to a regular network structure? Regular network structure where my uh, my my, um, my, um, my networks um, that parameters theta don't vary. Well, how do I get there? Like, you know, we call this a deterministic network. Deterministic network. Uh, the deterministic network is nothing but the limit of Q of theta is delta of theta minus theta zero, where my networks just have, when my parameters just have, just have one value, right? Um, you can do that here. If you think about this, then my KL divergence of of Q and P, what does it become? Well, this is the case, special case where my Q distributions 
uh, sigma uh, theta zero gets is is the is the, is the mu mu q here, right? And um, sigma q is zero, right? So what do I get here? I get a zero term here, and then I get a sigma p divided by sigma p squared. This says like you know is just like you know a constant. I can forget this about this here in, the, in my argument. I'm left here is that term, and that is uh, mu q is theta zero minus mu of the prior squared divided by two sigma p squared plus constant that I don't care. This is not even convergent, but fine. Just that constant. Now, think about that. Like for anybody who's ever seen like, you know, one of those, like, you know, a, a regular network loss, this KL divergence, I mean, this is the likelihood here. Oh, by the way, if you like make this deterministic, then this again goes away, this goes away, and this points the log p of x training data given theta zero. This is really the chi squared I just gave you, All right? So the likelihood loss, okay, you can just generalize this. But what happens with the KL divergence? Well, the KL divergence becomes something like, well, if you think about it, that looks awfully like, you know, Gaussian 2 or whatever. But like, you know, in, in, in the technical um, machine learning language, what does it do? You want to minimize the memory. You minimize the loss function. You want this to be small, right? Well, this object here in the loss function tells you that your um, thetas, the network parameters, right, cannot be too far away from, like, you know, something, like, you know, by some measure of mu p and sigma p. They have to, like, you know, you're forcing them into a, 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 um, into a Gaussian structure, like, you know, given by your prior. If you look into, like, you know, the standard network literature, that's called a regularization. This is nothing but a regularization forcing your network to kind of focus its network weights. Now, they don't have a distribution. It's just the absolute, the, regular, the, the deterministic value. Right. So what we have here is we have here a network um, um, that has it's strictly called an L2 regularization because you know it has the square term here, uh, absolute value. So this is an L2 regularization. So what we have now um, we have a network that um, has two terms in the loss function. It has a likelihood loss which we know before, like this is essentially the same thing for our fit, right? Except with the, now with the, with, the, with, the, with the new feature that like, you know, our thetas, our network parameters can vary. But aside from that, that's a regular likelihood loss. And the second term that if you go into your deterministic less network is a regularization. Now, if you're in the lit literature of machine learning, regularization plays a huge role to stabilize training of networks. For our properly defined loss function here, it comes out. You get it for free. As a matter of fact, it's there. You can't even get rid of it yeah, because it's a prior, and the prior is there. But here now, the prior is actually doing a good job. The prior acts as a numerical constraint on your distribution, on your network distributions. It keeps your network from like going all over the place, which in principle it could. The prior is forcing to do this. Now, as every good, good frequentist, when you train a network, well, play with that prior because this prior is still a parameter, it's a hyperparameter of your network, so it's a parameter of like your network architecture, right? Make it Gaussian, fine, right? Let's assume the whole stuff is Gaussian. Um, when you do that, yeah, right? I mean, these priors, I mean, you can, you can do standard scaling and like move them all around zero. That you can do just by shifting, but this parameter, sigma p here in your Gaussian, that's a given, a network parameter, hyperparameter, and that you play with. And we did, we all do all the time. Right? And if I do this, then I have an honest to God L2 regularized likelihood loss. Starting from this definition of, um, of our network is trained. Right? Nothing with MSE stuff, like you know, all that everybody else does. Like, you know, this is I like this because it's like a little proper, like you know, everything is kind of well defined all of a sudden. This is not Am I recorded? It's, that's, not, that's, not, that's, not, that's not chemistry, right? This is proper science. 
Um, no, so like, you know, this is, this is not this kind of, oh, I need another term, and like, you know, this is running away, so I need a regularization, I need this, and like, blah, blah, blah. And strictly speaking, by the way, if you think about it, this one here, for those of you who know a little bit of machine, this is a dropout, right? I mean, this is what people, in, I mean, people, people impl invent this to stabilize network training, they call this a dropout. It's also like, you know, the sampling step is part of our network training. So what I've tr tried to write down is, for these Bayesian networks where you basically allow your observable that described by the network to have a distribution and you match, map this distribution on network weights and now everything has like, you know, has a, has a proper uncertainty and so on and so forth, then you get this all nice and well defined. And this is why I love my Bayesian, Bayesian network. I also love them, you'll see that later because you can do a lot of nice things with them. But I love them because they allow you to write down a loss function that makes sense. And you don't have to construct it in many different steps and then, say like, and then think about the brain. No, it's like, you know, think about variation approximation, base theorem, done. Comes out. Good? Am I done? Okay, huh? okay good, then questions. <laughs> Good. Uh, um, can you comment a bit more on this trial? It seems quite random to me. And uh, like, what does it tell us in the tutorial where we are going to? Yeah. Um, if, uh, what it does is. Um, let's like, let, forget about the Bayesian version of it. For a regular network, right? What happens is you want your training bec um, to be like, you know, stable, numerically stable. Now the problem is that, that the typical network weights, they are defined on the real axis somewhere, right? I mean like somewhere, they're real numbers. They could be as large and big and as small as possible. Now, we are always trying with these networks, okay, like you know, weights to like, you know, to make them kind of small, order one, blah, 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 blah. But the, at, at the end of the day, everybody is always afraid of like, you know, runaway solutions. Things like, you know, go out of control. Go out of control. So, like, you know, they become very large, very small, and you get a mix of very, and very, very large and very small, like, you know, contributions to your loss function, and then the small ones are relevant, you don't see them anymore, because, and, and the old, big ones are just runaway solutions, and this is basically, you're done, right? But your the net training will not converge. So this is like, you know, why you would include a regularization in the regular, regular network training. So it's really just a numerical stabilization. It keeps you from runaway solutions. Um, here, it's slightly different. Here, what it's doing is, if you think about this middle more philosophically, right? So this is a loss function, you want to minimize it. This one here is the negative likelihood, log likelihood. So this basically, this, this term becomes very small when the, when the network um, um, description agrees very well with the training data, right? I mean, this is that term, right? Um, however, this, uh, the, 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 the network can do with this a Q of theta, whatever it wants, right? This, uh, the, 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 here would then be the term where I say, like, I want my Q of theta to be, uh, have a certain reasonable form. Like, I mean, if you don't want to use, I mean, here at this stage, you don't want to make them Gaussian, you can, like, you know, I mean, certainly what you want them single mode. I do, you don't want bimodal Q of theta stuff and stuff like this, right? I mean, you want them single mode for every theta, right? So this is basically um, the, the second term um, in, in my, in my, um, in my, in my uh, Bayesian network loss um, is where you want a, um, a well-defined, like, you know, distribution of, of, of the individual network um, uh, parameters. Well-defined as not too far away from the prior. First thing you'd like this prior would then enforce that it's like, you know, single mode. And the second one, it's like, you know, it's not too large and not too big. Um, we play with this, actually, when we, like, when, we, when we apply these networks. We play them, we vary the prior over, over many, many orders of magnitude. What happens is, if, um, how does it go? If the prior becomes too small, um, then your network, um, the, this becomes like too narrow, what I mean. So the width of this becomes too narrow. Then your distribution of the queues that you allow yeah, are, are very constrained to be also very narrow. But at the end of the day, I want this queue of theta to like, you know, map out uncertainties or like, you know, noise in my data or something like that. So at some point, you are pre you're, you're, you're being too, um, you're being, if you're forcing your network into a stability that doesn't exist in the data. 
So uh, the general rule of thumb, I think, would be make this Gaussian and don't make it too small because then you're forcing the network to be unexpressively self-confident. And then you make it bigger, right? And then at some point the network, like you know, has to find the like you know a good balance between the two. And then it's like any prior. Um, it um, if you then get it like you know you know which range it is, right? Um, they should all be equivalent in the result. However, if you choose a very stupid prior, it gets costly to learn. I mean, this is always the same, right? I mean, if you're stupid, if, if you're, think of like, you know, a regular Bayesian analysis. If you, your data is good, so like, you know, your data will determine the output, the outcome of your, of your measurement. However, if you uh, choose a stupid prior, you're going to scan over a huge amount of parameter space, which like, you know, the data all violently disagrees with. And so, like you know, like it, it'll take your 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 combined analysis with the prior a long time to zoom to zoom in what's actually the delta tells you. However, if you like you know you choose your prior to like you know kind of anticipate some of this a little bit bigger than the beta anticipated the delta distribution, you get a stabilizing result. And this is the way I would think about this. And it's dangerous if, they, if you choose too small, then the network will be, give you a wrong result. And if you choose it too big, the network will take longer than it should, or it needs to. Uh, can you comment more on uh, dropout and how it is connected with this statistic loss term? Oh, yeah, ca I can. Um, also, for, for those of you who like, you know, don't know what dropout is, essentially a dropout is uh, when you uh, take a, um, you construct a loss function um, and, um, and you evaluate it, but when you, like, you know, evaluate the loss function for a given data set, you don't take all data points, you just take some of them, right? You throw away some. So um, think of Q of theta being a Bernoulli distribution, zeros and ones, right? Only zeros and ones. Then um, for those uh, like the events where like, or like for those uh, with phase space point where like, you know, Q becomes, the Bernoulli distribution becomes zero, this term here will not contribute to the final loss, so you have thrown those away. The only other, like you know, number known to the Bernoulli distribution is one. In which case, this one is a one, and you get the regular, like you know, like the loss. Right. So you can think of this essentially um, as, like you know, if, if this is a Bernoulli distribution, you have to drop out. It doesn't have to be. You can pick anything you want, but it's something. What I'm saying is, it's 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 not foreign to to to, to machine learning tech training, right? This is really. You can think of this as as a dropout, and you can also implement it as a dropout. And then it's clearly not Bernoulli, but the simplest um, dropout would be ben, make this Bernoulli, and you get the standard dropout where you throw away events, like you know. So. Dropout means, as I said, like you know, you, you toss certain uh, like events, a certain fraction of your event, events, like you know, you throw away when you calculate and the loss that could be stabilizing. See you, see you tomorrow or like this afternoon whenever the other lectures start. <laughs>